Good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2020. We have received apologies today from Emma Harper and we have been joined by Bob Donis in his role as substitute member of the committee. I would ask all members to ensure that their mobile phones are on site. First item on our agenda is an evidence session on COVID-19 resilience and emergency planning with regards to preparedness for the pandemic and how future outbreaks of coronavirus or other pandemics may be managed. I welcome to the committee Jean Freeman, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, and she is accompanied by Jason Leach, National Clinical Director of the Scottish Government, and John Conachan, Interim Chief Executive of NHS Scotland. Thank you for joining us today. In a moment, I will invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement uh, in uh, about to five minutes, uh, and we will then take questions from members in turn. Uh, Due to the challenges of managing a virtual meeting such as this, we're going to take questions in a pre-arranged order. And once each member has exhausted their questions, I will invite them to proceed. Can I ask uh, members and uh, witnesses to keep questions and answers succinct and to the point? I can ask you also, please, to give broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate your microphone uh, before beginning to ask a question or to provide an answer. And can I ask members to indicate uh, by saying when they're on their final question. Thank you very much, and I now invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement of up to five minutes. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning to you, convener, and to colleagues. Uh, I'm grateful for the invitation to attend the committee to discuss our resilience and emergency planning arrangements for pandemics and other emergency situations. I want to start by recording my continuing <coughs> thanks for the response and the efforts of all those involved across many organisations in Scotland. Our combined approach in responding to COVID-19 has been built on the planning and preparations we have had in place for several years. At a local, regional and national level, our response has been based on these plans. And Where there have been challenges in dealing with this new virus, the foundations of our resilience planning has allowed us to adapt our response arrangements where necessary. Pandemic flu planning has been the highest national risk to Scotland, the UK and indeed the world for a number of years. And quite rightly, our planning has been to mitigate and prepare for that. But COVID-19 has been different. This new virus has been an unprecedented global event, which has presented many challenges for nations across the world. And whilst this has not been an influenza pandemic, the principles of resilience planning has allowed us to deal effectively with those areas that are similar to an influenza response, and where there have been unique issues with COVID, we have been flexible in adapting and managing our approach. The common planning elements for responding to pandemics are as follows. Workforce issues, planning for the loss of staff that could be affected directly or indirectly, Deployment of staff, having plans to manage how staff can be deployed using retired staff or volunteers. Healthcare services, planning for the reconfiguration of services and pathways to cope with the patient demand that is anticipated. Demand and capacity planning, uh, prioritising services to release capacity. Supply chain, having arrangements in place to ensure supply chains are not disrupted and contingency arrangements are in place. Communication strategy, having robust plans to ensure effective and proactive communications and engagement with staff, partner agencies and the public. Partnership working and command control and coordination, ensuring the emergency incident response structures are in place, roles and responsibilities are set out and clearly understood. All of these are key elements of pandemic planning, and I would argue they are key elements that we have seen in our response and have stood as well. They also correspond with the WHO checklist on pandemic planning. COVID-19 has required a flexible approach to how we treat COVID patients in NHS facilities. We have made several important interventions to quickly remodel service delivery, including quadrupling our ICU capacity, erecting the NHS Louisa Jordan, uh, and at no point, uh, I am pleased to say, has our NHS been overwhelmed, which is testament to the efforts of everyone involved. 
But the pandemic and its challenges are not over. I, I and I hope the committee appreciate that when faced with a new emergency situation like COVID, we need to continually learn about how to deal with it. We are on a journey that is likely to last a considerable amount of time and requires continued and extensive effort. Lessons have already been learned and implemented, for example, in the supply and distribution of PPE across health and social care. We also recently introduced a lesson learnt process for regional resilience partnerships and their member organisations in order to capture key issues, share good practice and ultimately help shape future planning and preparations, including the possibility of a second wave. The challenges remain, not least how we respond to the non-COVID health harms created by our necessary response. Addressing these whilst retaining a COVID response capacity is a major part of our focus at this point. The Committee will be aware of Remobilise, Recover and Redesign the Framework for NHS Scotland, which was published on 31 May. The framework outlines how NHS Scotland will work to make the changes necessary to restart as many aspects of our NHS as possible and safely, while considering the possibility of a second wave and, of course, uh, the, the approach of winter and necessary winter planning. Our emergency and resilience planning has helped negate the full impact and consequences caused by COVID-19. As a government, we remain committed to protecting the people of Scotland from this disease and we will continue to work collaboratively with our partners in Scotland, with other UK nations and indeed globally to minimise these impacts and consequences of COVID-19 and other diseases and emergency situations that may arise, be they environmental disasters or acts of terrorism. Uh, convener, I know the committee's public consultation in preparation for today's, today's session raised various issues and that members will have many questions and I look forward to answering them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. And let me start by asking about some of the work that was done over recent years to prepare for such an eventuality as this pandemic. We're aware of uh, Operation Silver Swan. We've spoken about that with you before. Operation Cygnus, which was sponsored by Public Health England, but in which the Scottish Government was a participant, uh, and Exercise Iris, which was conducted to look at uh, a potential Middle East and respiratory uh, syndrome outbreak in Scotland. Uh, first of all, can I ask, with the, 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 there were 13 recommendations in the summary of actions on, on can I ask uh, how far all of those actions were followed through? Uh, in particular, I'm, I'm interested in the recommendation that the feasibility of community surveillance for high consequence infections to be considered, uh, and also that the resource impact of contact tracing uh, for infectious diseases uh, uh, worked out. Can, can I ask you about those recommendations in particular, and about generally the implementation of the yeah, thank you very, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, as you say, Exercise Iris identified 13 action points that covered guidance, specialist facilities, uh, provision of PPE, and contact tracing. The Scottish Health Protection Network um, has been leading work to follow up on the actions from the exercise as part of wider work on preparedness for high consequence infectious diseases. And as you recall, uh, initially COVID-19 was designated as uh, HCID uh, and then later um, de-designated as such. Um, the work of um, the Health Protection Network included setting up a high consequence infectious disease subgroup uh, specifically to look at preparedness for managing such diseases, bringing in membership from public health professionals, microbiologists, infection control professionals, uh, epidemiologists, pharmacists and uh, pub involving Public Health England. A number of areas of work have been completed to date and without taking up time to go through those, convener, I'm happy to uh, send you a detailed list of that. Uh, the uh, then Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Gregor Smith, uh, wrote out to uh, local authority chief execs, NHS board chief execs, health and social care partnerships, resilience partnerships, 
um, uh, resilience officers in local authorities and the health service, and NHS pandemic flu coordinators, um, with a range of uh, issues that needed to be followed up. He sent that in 2017, uh, attaching to it uh, a number of actions uh, across those recommendations uh, that were either ongoing in terms of, for example, uh, personal uh, protective equipment, or uh, had to be completed by March, uh, uh, March 2018, I should say. Uh, <clears throat> many of those have been completed, and again, uh, I'm very happy to provide you with the detail of those. Uh, and uh, we had a, another piece of work that was about to uh, begin, but has been paused because of the pandemic, which was a set of further recommendations. Uh, from uh, Sir Lewis Ritchie, um, which, as I say, have been paused, but will be picked up uh, as we uh, move through dealing with this pandemic and look again, partly at lessons learned, but partly at ensuring that some of those recommendations and those additional recommendations from Sir Lewis are followed through. Thanks very much, and I'm glad that uh, Dr. Smith wrote to local authorities on health and care partnerships. I guess looking at the exercises in the round, one of the things that's striking is how little involvement there was from those bodies which were responsible for social care. Uh, one of the scenarios, for example, suggested that social care colleagues might usefully be included in the command and control structures of health boards for responding uh, to a pandemic uh, outbreak. Has that been followed through, and, 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 and what structures are in place to include? those responsible for social care in, in the, the key day-to-day -day decision? So, the health, yeah, sorry, the, the health and social care partnerships are not legislatively designated as uh, uh, first or second responders in terms of the Civil Contingency Act, which governs the overall structure around the uh, resilience um, programme, both regional and local and Scottish. Uh, resilience partnerships. However, for COVID-19, uh, they were actively involved in uh, local resilience planning, uh, which flowed through and from uh, Scottish level resilience planning through to regional resilience planning to local and back the way. So, although they are not uh, legally designated in the groups to be involved, they have been involved in the uh, resilience planning for this pandemic. And that will be uh, one of the lessons, I think, to be followed through uh, in future uh, resilience planning and the overall structure for resilience planning is to ensure that our health and social care partnerships uh, are built into that framework um, in order to make sure that they are involved, because, of course, they have played a key role along with local authorities in a number of our responses in practical terms, not least the PPE hubs locally, but also the work in order, uh, to support uh, those individuals shielding uh, and the particular practical support steps that are needed uh, to help them um, follow uh, the guidance that we've given. Thanks very much, and I look forward to receiving from you some of the uh, detail you've mentioned. One of the uh, uh, recommendations of the Irish report, and indeed all of the exercises made reference to the role of the Scottish Government Resilience Unit, particularly in areas like Has the role of the Scottish Government Resilience Unit changed in any way since 2018? Um, I, I think the, the role of uh, our Resilience Unit has strengthened over that time uh, in terms of uh, being, a, if you like, a core of expertise and knowledge around resilience planning for a number of different emergencies. Um, the Scottish Government's Resilience Room was stood up on the 29th of January uh, and has been uh, active ever since, uh, meeting frequently. Um, most, when it was stood up, it was uh, chaired by the First Minister. DFM has chaired it uh, on one or two occasions, and FM has uh, Shared ever since, uh, and I have attended all of them. Uh, part of its uh, expertise, if you like, and part of what uh, has uh, assisted mm -hmm. our learning uh, has indeed been our Brexit planning and our Brexit No Deal planning, which has assisted 
that, in, that cross-government response, so that although, uh, of course, in the initial stages, health was the, the predominant uh, responder to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and remains uh, a lead responder, uh, we have always been conscious of the importance of other parts of government and therefore other parts of local government uh, being aware or initially of potential consequences and planning in anticipation of those and then increasingly have a, having a more active engagement in uh, resilience planning in, in terms of the economy, communities, impacts on particular vulnerable groups and so on. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call Alex Colhammond. Thank you very much, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I have three questions. I'll try to keep them brief. Um, in the Silver Swan report, uh, my questions are largely all about Operation Silver Swan. And in the Silver Swan report, the Scottish Government acknowledged that a global pandemic would represent the single most disruptive event to face Scotland. At the follow-up meeting after the exercise on the 6th of December, led by Acting CMO Gregor Smith, delegates from across Scotland told your government, and I quote, resource pressures and competing priorities were having a significant impact on the ability to properly plan and prepare for a pandemic. Was this feedback uh, passed to your government and what did you do about it? So undoubtedly the feedback would have been passed to government and it would have been factored into uh, how we, we attempted to manage resource pre pressures <clears throat> and priorities. Uh, clearly planning for a pandemic is important. The, the core elements which I uh, outlined in my opening statement and which matched the WHO checklist uh, were, uh, were in place. And I think we can see from our experience so far that many of those elements stood us in good stead, not least the stockpiling of PPE by um, our national procurement uh, and supply service uh, and our capacity to very quickly remobilise and uh, refocus the NHS to prepare for what at that point were the uh, reasonable worst case scenario predictions or estimates uh, coming from SAGE and from other scientific and clinical colleagues. Um, competing priorities and resource pressures are a constant feature in health as in any other part of government and we simply have to do our very best to manage those as best we can. Alex Thank you very much. You, you mentioned the WHO checklist. I, I'm glad you did that. I actually have it in front of me. It's called a, a checklist for pandemic influenza risk and impact management. Um, but it mentions testing 25 times, yet Operation Silver Swan doesn't mention it once. Um, if you weren't using the WHO checklist thoroughly, um, what were you checking? Operation Silver Swan against, and do you now accept that the failure to consider mass testing in Silver Swan has set us back considerably in the handling of this pandemic? Uh, well, I've actually got the WHO checklist in front of me too, Mr. Cole Hamilton, and uh, have read the entire document. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't accept that there was a failure to uh, consider mass testing. I think. Uh, what was clear from the clinical advice and the scientific advice and the four nation plan, so it was a four nation approach, was that the first phase of our response would be to attempt to contain uh, the incidence and prevalence of COVID-19. And in that, contact tracing, test trace, and now what we would describe as test and protect, was a, a key feature of that response with the expectation that because of how the virus operates and the way in which it transmits, that uh, we were likely to have to move to the delay phase, at which point you are taking steps to suppress the incidence of the, the virus and its prevalence is such that uh, contact tracing is no longer an appropriate response. It won't work for you. You can't isolate clusters of the virus in the way that you can attempt to do that in the first phase. And therefore, your testing strategy has to be flexible enough to move to where you need it to operate, which uh, at that point was ensuring where we could that key workers who were isolating because of a household uh, member 
uh, could be tested in order that they may return to work if they didn't have the virus. Uh, surveillance testing was part of that. So the testing strategy has adapted to two things: one, an inc- a significant increase in our testing capacity from where we were in February this year, to and also adapting to uh, how the virus is behaving and how we are learning about that virus and our um, capacity to suppress it, which is where we are now. I still need to suppress it further, but introducing into that suppression the opportunity to ease lockdown measures, but critically alongside those, the test and protect strategy needs to operate at that same time and is currently doing that. So um, I think that there there is a there's an importance in understanding and, and perhaps I, I have Professor Leach with me this morning. He may want to uh, add to this. There is an importance in understanding uh, the application of WHO uh, guidance and checklists to the different economic, social uh, and healthcare situations that you will find in countries around the world. WHO needs to operate in a way that what it says is relevant to all, uh, but each country then needs to take that and apply it to its own situation. And that is what I believe we have done. Alex Kohat. Thank you for that answer, Cabinet Secretary. But I come back to the checklist, and it is in front of me here. It says 25 times about testing, surveillance testing, test, track and trace, um, about contact tracing, all of, all of this. Um, I, and yet your answer is you suggest that they write the guidance as a catch-all for everybody, but it doesn't apply to some people. And the, the fact that we didn't discuss it at all in Operation Silver Swan suggests to me that we didn't actually have a testing strategy. And every non-government uh, witness who's come before this committee in this COVID-19 inquiry has said that we were hopelessly underprepared for testing, that we should have been mobilising life science labs, university labs for mass testing from the very start, but that just didn't happen. So can you tell me, do you re- do you think it was a misstep of your government to not consider testing in Silver Swan? Um, so uh, I need to say a few things, and then I do want to bring in uh, Professor Leach. Uh, first of all, I did not say that it, uh, that WHO in its approach means that some of what it says you can take it or leave it. I did not say that. What I said was that every country needs to take the WHO guidance and apply it to its own situation in terms of its economy, its society, and in this instance, particularly its healthcare system. And that uh, is exactly what we did. Secondly, it is incorrect to say that we did not have a testing strategy. If we hadn't had a testing strategy, we would not have been able to do contact tracing at the very start of this pandemic in the containment phase, which we did. Uh, and uh, you know, I uh, don't hesitate to mention it at all. It was a key feature in response to the Nike conference. And I'm sure you have read the University of Glasgow's uh, important piece of research and report Uh, on the outcome of that, as well as uh, other work. So our testing strategy was there. It was developed as the virus spread and prevalence developed, and as our capacity for testing developed. And I don't accept either that we did not engage with university labs uh, and others. That is how our testing capacity has increased. It has increased through our NHS labs and in our partnerships with the University of Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dundee and Aberdeen. That is the basis on which NHS testing capacity is now at the level that it is, complemented by the testing capacity in the Lighthouse Lab. Now, if I may, I will bring Professor Leach in, who is much more knowledgeable than I, on the WHO and uh, its guidance. Thank you very much. Jason. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary and Mr Cole-Hamilton. I, I, think, I think you've covered the the fundamentals of of why this exercise did what this exercise did. I, I maybe should add some context for these exercises in the convener's question as well. It, MERS has, in total, across the whole world, infected two and a half thousand people. Two and a half thousand people. This virus has infected eight million. This is a global pandemic. We've never said those words before. This is on a different scale from anything the world has faced 
in living memory. So therefore, of course, those exercises inform what our response is. And actually, I've been very relieved that that national, regional and local resilience partnership has been in place. And we've been able to speak to the police on a weekly basis, been able to speak to the IJBs, etc., all the way down. The Silver Swan exercise was for influenza, uh, a well-known, well-established disease known throughout the world, known in all of the WHO's 194 countries, with a well-established vaccination program globally and well-established testing programs globally. Poor treatment, still poor treatment programs, actually. Doesn't have the mortality rate that MERS, MERS kills 35% of its infected victims. The COVID-19 virus kills about one to two percent of its affected individuals, tra tragically. But they are they are incomparable. What is comparable, of course, is having your resilience agile enough to be able to respond to whatever you face. It, it was impossible, I would maintain, to predict that this global pandemic would happen at this point with this virus, and therefore you have to have as much as possible in place. And then, in an agile way, respond to what you have. And we took the WHO's advice. Of course, we did, as did Syria, as did New Zealand, as did Somalia. And we applied that advice to our health system, our PPE stockpiles, which we had, and our testing ability and testing science that we had available to us. And then we worked immediately to adapt to the present virus and the present pandemic and got to the position we're in today. Thank you Can very much. Uh, uh, briefly, Alex Cohan. Thank you for that. Yes, I mean, Jason Leach, I appreciate your contribution there. You, you said that this um, Operation Silver Swan was a, a, a plan for influenza, for normal common or garden influenza sweeping the world. But the WHO checklist specifically says don't just plan for the normal flu, plan for novel viruses as well. And I just can't think that why in the, all of the corridors of government, nobody thought at that point, maybe we should expand this to something we haven't seen before, perhaps something that's more sticky, more virulent, more busy and kills more people. Um, why, why did that never factor into the, the sort of planning around Silver Swan? Well, not because we're bad people, not because we're bad people, Mr. Cole Hamilton, that's for sure. <laughs> So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not a. It's not a sorry to can, can I call in the cabinet secretary? I'm sure we'll get another opportunity. Cabinet secretary. <clears throat> Thanks very much, convener. Um, as um, Professor Leach was about to say, uh, in planning for uh, influenza yeah. pandemic, and actually the WHO checklist is for influenza pandemic preparedness planning. Uh, it is precisely the, the point that you have to have those core elements. That's why I read them out in my opening statement. Those core elements are the core foundations on which pandemic planning for uh, anything is required to rest on. The key is then to have the flexibility to adapt that to the particular uh, virus or infection that you are confronting. And as Professor Leach has said, the the scale of COVID-19 compared to what was previously considered to be the highest risk of a pandemic globally, which was influenza, is considerable. And I think those foundations of pandemic planning, uh, which I have listed, uh, are in our resilience planning here in Scotland and actually in the rest of the UK and have allowed us to uh, respond as quickly as we have done and adapt to what we uh, what we have to face. Now, there, <clears throat> there are undoubtedly lessons from that for, for us, and I'm happy to uh, indicate what some of those might be in due course, uh, for our future uh, pandemic and resilience planning work. Um, we will have lessons that we need to learn. So, too, will our uh, regional and local resilience partnerships, they will want to feed things into us so that our next uh, iteration of pandemic planning uh, has learned from uh, this, which has to be uh, one of the largest uh, scale pandemic uh, exercises, and it's real, that we have had to deal with. Thank you very much. And briefly again, Jason Leach. Thank you, convener. I would only add that flu I, I wouldn't describe as common or garden. Flu kills half a million people a year globally. 
it kills many thousands in the UK. Preparing for standard flu, winter flu, it is an enormous exercise across the United Kingdom every year. And preparing for a flu pandemic, which would uh, we anticipate kill many more than half a million globally, is also a very, very worthwhile thing to do. And inside that, that allows you to think about your resilience for other more novel attacks from bacteria or viruses like we now face. Thank you very much. And I now call it Brian Biddle. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning to the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you for giving up your time. Nice to see Professor Leach, Mr. Conahan on the call. Um, following on from, from uh, your comments there, Cabinet Secretary, I want to look ahead as to how we would potentially uh, change our approach um, given the current, uh, the current uh, pandemic, which, as uh, Professor Leach has said, uh, was difficult to predict. Um, can I ask, in terms of this, uh, initially, Sir Ian Boyd's comments around the national security risk assessment uh, and so sort of anticipating uh, what might come down the line, and the fact that he's suggesting that the NSRA do not consider aggregated risk? Can I ask a simple question to start with? Given uh, that we live in a small island, is it realistic, possible, or even desirable? Uh, to depart from a UK-wide planning uh, for identified national risk. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> so I I I don't think it is as quite as binary as that as as it's either UK or it is the individual nations of the UK. Uh, what we have collectively, all four nations of the UK, attempted to do is to recognise those areas that require uh, a four-nation response. But with it, I also recognise that uh, each part of the UK may respond in, in implementation at a different pace or in a slightly different way. So we are attempting in this response to manage the uh, to manage devolution, if you like, and apply devolution. Uh, and I think so far. We have uh, reasonably successfully done that. I think it was entirely appropriate for us to work for and agree a four nation plan in our response uh, that we would uh, actively use the um, expertise and experience of SAGE, uh, of NEVTAG, of the various groups that would feed into that, uh, and that we would, as we did, uh, establish our own CMO advisory uh, body, which which uh, links directly with Sage, uh, but also allows that evidence to be applied to the particular situation in Scotland. Even in terms of geography and demography, there are differences in the in what we are responding to. Um, so uh, I think I think we have to keep on trying to uh, manage both because. Um, whilst there is an overall risk that applies um, across the United Kingdom, there are uh, differences in how that risk might um, evidence itself in different parts of the country. And I think uh, if you look, for example, uh, at England, you can see differences in how the virus is playing out in different parts uh, of England. Uh, and some of what we are learning, of course, is its um, particular impact on particular um, cohorts of our population, not simply those who are older, but also uh, those with particular underlying health conditions or characteristics. And we're learning that as we go. The, the point is worth making, I think, about this being a new virus. And it is genuinely a, a journey of learning led by all that um, scientific work that is going on. I think Professor Leach, uh, if I may quote him, um, I have heard him say that the scientific community globally has never worked as fast as it is doing uh, right now in order to understand and anticipate what this virus might do and how it might perform. And that's really important for us because whilst we're in the beginning of the summer, uh, we are looking ahead at what winter might bring us in terms of seasonal uh, respiratory and flu uh, and other conditions 
and where, where we need to be with this virus uh, before what comes at us in normal course arrives. Thank you very much. Brian Whittle. Hey, thank you, Kevin. I mean, thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for that, Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I think I'm looking, I'm really looking here, not so much in how you responded this time, but how we can learn from this and how we should move forward. Uh, you know, the planning for identified national risks. I think if I could go to, to we, we mentioned Operation Cygnus before, which uh, was a major planning exercise, which did identify an issue of fragility uh, of the supply chain, um, and, and uh, as the Royal College of Physicians suggested. That fragility it was not acted upon. Um, I, I think also they go on to say it would have been helpful uh, to have more focus on a wider public health and health and social care system as a whole, rather than concentrating on secondary care and the NHS. So, with that in mind, can I, can I ask, looking currently uh, the, the, how, how it worked out this time, and how in future the Scottish government consider resilience in terms of an aggregated risk in relation to both health and social care? Government Secretary. Well, well, of course, it's important to say that Operation Cygnus was looking at uh, the position in England. Uh, it was not looking at the situation in Scotland. Silver Swan did that the year before, um, and the NHS in Scotland uh, did not participate in Operation Cygnus, was not invited to participate, nor were our local authorities. So, whilst the uh, lessons from Operation Cygnus um, are uh, of interest and uh, are important, they are not as directly applicable. And so, I would um, not accept that there was fragility in the supply chain for PPE in Scotland, for example. Uh, it was sorely tested. And it had to um, scale up the volume of its uh, ordering and uh, diversify uh, the uh, routes that it had to deliver on supply, not least because it extended the supply beyond the NHS um, significantly into primary care, into community pharmacy, and into social care, uh, and uh, beyond that. To unpaid carers, to personal assistants, to funeral directors. Um, so there was a huge demand on that national procurement service. But the very fact that we had one, and that we had a stockpile, and we had a distribution network and a body of suppliers, stood us in good stead in order to stand all that up. There are lessons, though, from that, not least the distribution routes that we. Um, Fairly quickly put into place a range of different distribution routes that we would want to give serious thought to being able to retain that into future planning. So there are um, lessons already, I think, from our response that certainly, in my mind, are uh, features of future resilience planning that we would want to retain. And part of that is, um, I think, as you fairly. Uh, ask around the whole system response, um, which is a health and social care response uh, to an infectious uh, pandemic, or an infectious disease pandemic. I think, in the in terms of the practicalities of the response, it has been a whole system response. Health and social care partnerships, local authorities, uh, and other colleagues have been uh, intimately involved in the planning and the implementation of our response. Uh, did we give sufficient consideration to the impact of the virus on uh, primary and social care, uh, as opposed to secondary hospital-based care? Uh, arguably, our, our initial response, led by that uh, uh, view that 80 per cent of the population would be uh, infected, that 4 per cent of that number would require hospitalisation. That is what we responded to, that worst-case scenario, which required that significant uh, remobilization and refocusing of the NHS, upscal upscaling our ICU and bed capacity, and so on. Uh, we were aware of the importance of uh, social care and the vulnerability there, but we had made some assumptions, which arguably, in practice, were uh, too strongly made in terms of the reality of how that panned out. One of those assumptions being 
the level of uh, infection prevention and control measures uh, in residential settings across adult social care, um, which should flow from the National Infection Prevention and Control Manual, but as we uh, appreciated quickly, needed uh, sufficient additional support to ensure that they were in place. Um, thank you, uh, uh, convener. To be honest, Cabinet Secretary, I think, as, as you know, um, I certainly have been critical of the way uh, that things were initially uh, instigated around uh, around the bias. But I think we have to learn learn lessons. And to hear you say that you didn't think there was a fragility of supply chain within PPE initially, I think, uh, especially a lot in a lot of people within social care and the NHS would be surprised surprised to hear that. I think we do have to learn our lessons. But if I could ask my, my final question here, um, and to two of the major behavioural instructions that were employed are lockdown and uh, physical distances. And many of the submissions that we've had uh, suggest that there was no discussion in previous planning exercises and scenarios uh, for pandemic uh, flu type uh, conditions, um, which would require imposing lockdown or physical distancing. Um, in fact, the Shetland Council, if I, if I could quote them, say the plans did not anticipate the scale of the consequences of lockdown. So, can I finally ask, you know, that will lockdown and physical distancing and likes of face masks become a stock response in any future pandemic, flu, or, or, or otherwise? So, so if I can just make one point on the PPE, I, I do not accept that there was fragility in the supply. What there was was a need to improve the distribution network, and that is the basis on which uh, many of the initial uh, glitches around the delivery of PPE to the places where it needed to be delivered arose. Our response to that was to introduce four different supply routes. Um, and uh, what I am saying, though, is that we never at any point ran out of PPE, any element of PPE, and in fact, we were able to and happy to supply both NHS England and NHS Wales as part of the mutual aid arrangements. Uh, in terms of you know, would, would lockdown, would face masks, would physical distancing be part of any future response? It depends on the nature of the infection that you are dealing with. So, the use of face masks, the use of face coverings, physical distancing are all driven by the scientific and clinical understanding of this virus and how it transmits. Other infectious uh, diseases may transmit in a different way, in which case you introduce other measures in order to break the chains of transmission. So, uh, in our, uh, if, if you like, in our toolbox of uh, ways of responding, we now do have, <coughs> excuse me, experience of lockdown measures, experience of using distance, uh, whatever that may be, uh, as a means of breaking transmission chains. We have the use of face coverings and the particular use of particular types of PPE in clinical settings. Uh, it, all of which are driven by the response um, to this particular virus and how it is transmitted. Other viruses or infections will be transmitted in different ways, and so we may not always use uh, in the future these measures. We may use other measures. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I now call Sandra White? Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary Professor Leach and Mr Cornican. Uh, very nice to see you this morning. My questions are going to be more centred on central government and local government. And uh, I recollect Professor Leach mentioned uh, partnership working, uh, basically, and also uh, Cabinet Secretary and your comments at opening. You mentioned uh, pandemic planning, national, local, and interventions, and flexibility. <clears throat> the first two questions I'm going to ask is about subsidiarity and the other is regarding various points of control as well. Now, Andrew Kerr from the City of Edinburgh Council in evidence mentioned uh, basically that uh, incidents should be managed at the lowest level practicable under the principle of subsidiarity. 
and North Ant uh, Ayrshire Council in their submission uh, described the successes uh, in dealing with the issues very quickly according to planning in place via community planning partnerships and uh, very, very supportive of the community planning and partnerships and being able to deliver in the local communities. One area they did have concerns in is regarding um, duplication and conflicting guidance from government and multiple reportings, etc. So my first two questions would be is uh, what is your view of subsidiarity in, in relation to the response to COVID-19 in health and social care? And my second question would be in the future, I know you have touched on this actually, Cab Secretary, in the future how will you balance the clear statutory responsibilities of local authorities and health boards with centralised control given the experience which we've just heard uh, from some local authorities. And I should mention uh, Shetland uh, Council as well uh, put in some concerns in regards to various controls. Government Secretary. So I, I think subsidiarity is important. Um, and I would remind the committee that in terms of uh, resilience planning and partnerships, uh, that operates at national, regional and local level precisely for that reason. Uh, the Scottish Government's resilience operation directly involves uh, police and fire, of course, uh, as well as uh, the health service, but also solace, uh, uh, of which I think Andrew Kerr from Edinburgh uh, City Council is the, the president or the, the chair uh, of solace. So that is a uh, local government executive officer, senior officer. Uh, organisation and COSLA. Uh, both the President and the Chief Executive of COSLA are uh, on the uh, resilience uh, meetings and are, are members of that. And that is all about ensuring that uh, uh, we agree a collective national approach, uh, much of which is then implemented at local level. Of course, the NHS is is different in that uh, the NHS is a single organisation across Scotland uh, with clear national direction uh, and then local delivery. Uh, so uh, the the local delivery and those uh, the capacity of local authorities to respond as quickly as they have done um, <clears throat> to everything that was needed from uh, supporting the distribution of PPE locally to ensuring that essential services in local authority areas were maintained, to now uh, being able in those local resilience partnerships to have, according to each local authority, so it will differ, uh, the capacity to provide accommodation to anyone coming into the country required to quarantine uh, in the current uh, situation who does not have accommodation to quarantine in. Local authorities are making sure that that is provided. The, the work around shielding, the work around uh, support for the vulnerable and so on, has all been uh, driven and delivered at that local authority level, but uh, agreed that it was necessary at that national level, for, so for that national discussion. Um, in terms of much of the um, local primary care, community care, social care response, uh, our health and social care partnerships, uh, actively engaged there in making sure, working with local authority and the NHS locally, that we could ensure that there were uh, support packages in place, the funding, the additional funding that we have made available, channeled through local government or through uh, those um, health and social care partnerships. So, um, undoubtedly, uh, in due time, there will be a number of areas of feedback from the local, the regional and the national resilience partnerships um, where uh, there will be lessons and improvements to make uh, around, uh, I could think, uh, without knowing this, uh, that that would be perhaps around communication channels. It may be around guidance uh, and, and greater clarity of guidance, uh, and uh, I think that would be fair. Um, where at times, perhaps people have felt there has been too much guidance, and they're not mm. sure which one they're supposed to follow. That's partly been a reflection of the speed with which the learning uh, has been driven about the virus itself. So, a lot of clinical and practice guidance 
has changed much more frequently than you would expect um, or would have been anticipated previously in this kind of pandemic planning. But the nature of this virus and the speed with which we're learning about it has necessitated that, although I accept that that is, uh, can be confusing uh, and frustrating for people who are then charged with implementing that guidance. Thank you, thank, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I do recollect mentioning guidance before and having, uh, you know, basically the reply to that, where people were quite confused in that respect. Uh, I was interested in the fact you mentioned about Solace and Cosla. Uh, obviously, I would assume that, uh, for point of clarity, they would have been involved in any guidance which was given to local authorities in regard to changes. And one of the questions I wanted to ask was. Did the government, because we have had um, you know, correspondence or uh, heard from local authorities, uh, felt that central government were perhaps interfering too much, I'll use that word interfering uh, in that respect, was there any particular issues that uh, you know, national government, Scottish government had to interject in anything that was not being delivered by local authorities? In that respect, they were delivering very locally, um, local needs, local knowledge, local infrastructure. Was there any area in particular, apart from the guidance that you spoke about, that uh, central government would have to interject, put forward issues there that weren't being delivered? Yeah. So I can only speak for um, my own portfolio in terms of health and social care. Um, other uh, cabinet secretaries may have um, different views. I'm not aware that they, they would do um, in terms of local government and communities, or indeed uh, the deputy first minister, who leads our uh, national uh, level response and resilience response. Um, I, I would not describe the role of um, Scottish government as control, uh, but I think Scottish government has a clear responsibility and accountability for uh, setting the strategic direction and the requirements. Um, but you have to do that with those who are charged with the delivery. And in some of this, the delivery partners are local authorities, uh, or health and social care partnerships, or in my case, uh, our individual health boards. Um, where I, where I, so I don't, from my perspective in my portfolio, there hasn't been an area where we've intervened. There have been areas where we have um, discussed with individual uh, local authorities, for example, around the provision of social care packages, where there has been concern that pre-existing social care packages were being reduced or removed as part of a response to the pandemic. Uh, and my concern that uh, I did not believe that that should be happening. So the conversation then with the local authority partner is what what is driving that and what do you need for that not to happen so that we can see if we can provide that. That's partly why the additional resource was put in place in recognition that there would be a staffing impact, for example, um, in terms of social care with staff who were uh, off work either because they had the virus or because uh, one of their household uh, had the virus or they were shielding, they were in the shielding category. So there would be an impact on social care workforce as well as the NHS workforce. Anticipated, planned for, part of the reason why we issued that call for people to return to service uh, so that we could then use that additional resource to deploy out and help uh, strengthen uh, staff rotors where that was the case, both at local authority level uh, and in the NHS. So, uh, my, from my perspective, there's, there's been no situation where we have intervened. Um, there have been uh, conversations where either what we are asking for hasn't been clear, or a local authority uh, uh, has uh, obstacles in its way that we need to try and help them resolve. Or, for example, around PPE, the clarity that was brokered and provided through a conversation between myself, Cosla, and the relevant unions in terms of PPE for uh, social care staff uh, and what would be clear guidance for them about the, the right PPE that they should be able to access and expected to use. 
Thank, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you. Uh, you did mention resources. Now, my understanding that uh, an extra £155 million pounds has been given to local authorities might not be in their bank accounts, but they do have it there, as I met with my own local authority, Glasgow City Council, and they told me that it was there. Now, basically, I just wondered if you would know or if you could tell us, is there any proportion of that extra money, additional monies? Is it intended to support social care or community-based well-being services? Would that be your responsibility or the local authorities? So the the commitment we've given of over three hundred million, uh, one hundred and fifty-five of that is consequential. So there is additional over the consequentials from Scottish government, which is going to local authorities. But in addition, uh, I've uh, also committed an initial £50 million, which is directed uh, entirely towards the social care sector. Uh, so, uh, in terms of the uh, £300 million direct additional support for local government, which will be uh, being used, I imagine, primarily from Ms Campbell's portfolio uh, in terms of communities and uh, local government support in the additional services or the additional uh, support that they need to provide uh, in their response to the pandemic. Uh, I made sure that, that there was additional money on top of that for social care, and that is has been an initial £50 million uh, to, uh, out for supporting social care, and uh, there is an opportunity, if more is needed, for us to consider providing uh, more than the £50 million. Thank you very much, Matt. My last question, well, I do think you perhaps possibly have answered this one. You can just say yes or no, uh, Cabinet Secretary, if you like. Um, will there be learning from local planning partnerships and health and social care that we'll be talking about? Will that be taken on board or considered? And I think you did answer this question. You did mention about sharing for future planning. So I don't know if you want to elaborate or we just want to say yes, sir. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, there will be. The, the Scottish Resilience uh, Network, uh, led by uh, DFM, will undoubtedly initiate. There is already, as I said at the outset, um, some work already begun on lessons learned as we go, so that we make sure we capture everything. And um, Although it, it, it um, has not been very many months, um, the pace of uh, the activity has been considerable, so you need to kind of capture it as you go, make sure you do not lose any of it, but the, the Scottish Resilience Partnership will undoubtedly lead a, a, a major exercise receiving uh, input from local and regional resilience partnerships, but as well as a cross-governmental exercise uh, that I am sure DFM will also lead uh, in due course, so that all the government departments can feed in the, our individual lessons, including our intergovernmental working both within Scottish Government and with the other nations in the UK. Thank you very much. Thank you, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, my questions are around communications and technology. What barriers are you aware of hampered good communications with key stakeholders, primary care, community pharmacies, care providers, health and social care partnerships, and what measures are being considered to clarify and simplify key lines of communication for the future? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I would say actually that um, there, there's been a number of things that have been um, achieved in uh, this, the response to this pandemic, which were uh, objectives, if you like, prior to the pandemic that weren't completely achieved, that in a very short space of time uh, have been secured. Part of that is around how we have delivered healthcare, of course. But one of the others is um, the, the improvement, the significant improvement, I think, in uh, direct communications. Everything from my uh, now fortnightly, was weekly, call with the BMA and the RCN, Scottish Care, uh, the discussions that officials have on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, with different key stakeholders in community pharmacy or in primary care. Um, uh, John Conaghan, who has joined us, may want to say more about uh, the, the level of constant communication uh, with our uh, NHS boards uh, in terms of 
uh, issues that are being addressed, problems to be resolved, future planning that is underway. So I think that, uh, and also, of course, I, I should absolutely add the regular calls uh, officials have with um, the chief officers of health and social care partnerships, and the regular uh, telecalls that I have with my counterpart in COSLA, uh, Councillor uh, Stuart Curry. So the the communication level uh, has probably increased significantly over the course from the outset of the pandemic. Uh, and continues, uh, and that may in fact partly be because we cannot meet, uh, so we talk more frequently. Uh, and uh, I think that that I have not had any issues raised with me around communication, except that there may be times when the pace of what we have had to do and respond to um, has foreshortened. Uh, the normal way by which you would do more of a consultation before you then made decisions and uh, asked for uh, steps to be implemented. That has undoubtedly been foreshortened, but by and large, most stakeholders completely understand that. And for example, on care homes, we now have uh, the Rapid Action Group, which brings all those key stakeholders together. So there is much more, albeit over a shorter time frame, consultative work before decisions are taken about additional steps or supports uh, to introduce to support the care home sector. And the recovery group, which is part of the remobilization, recover and redesign of our health service, uh, and will meet before the end of this month, has a wide range of stakeholders from both the, the clinical community, the Royal Colleges, uh, our boards, our health and social care partnerships, but also through into social care with uh, SOLAS and COSLA and other key stakeholders all involved uh, in a group that I will chair, uh, de developing how we will uh, remobilise and redesign uh, our NHS as we um, move, I hope, out of this particular pandemic. David Trott. Cabinet Secretary, what work is underway to create a shared IT platforms for emergency purposes between all community planning partners, but especially health and social care partnerships? Cabinet Secretary. So we have uh, Resilience Direct, which is a well-established and secure IT platform. It's maintained by the Cabinet Office, um, uh, and it enables uh, UK-wide uh, resilience partners and practitioners to work together. Uh, we also have, uh, in terms of uh, COVID itself, uh, we're building um, on the, the um, quite excellent data and expertise we have in Scotland. The Scottish COVID-19 Data and Intelligence Network is leading on a range of activities so that we have real-time data and intelligence to inform uh, effective pandemic response at all the levels we've discussed. That will clearly serve as well for the future too. Uh, we're making the data accessible to planning partners and other organisations. Uh, and for example, it used extensively in the uh, new management information system for test and protect. Statistics have already been produced from that. And uh, at the end of May, we launched the new COVID data research service, which provides secure access to data to, uh, for planning partners, for academia, and for others, um, to so that they can get answers to key analytical and research questions around the nature of the spread, the risks, and the effects of COVID-19 to help with their planning work, but obviously in terms of research uh, and academia to help with the work that they are all undertaking, which feeds back into us uh, for our own uh, planning response. David Trump. My final question, Convener. Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned care homes earlier. Could you say more about the progress on a digital strategy for care homes? Cabinet Secretary. So, um, th there has been, um, I, I suppose you would say, fresh light shone by the COVID-19 uh, on the potential use of digital technology in care homes, including improving data flows, uh, but also encouraging homes um, to engage with healthcare in uh, more effective ways than uh, necessarily always uh, having that physical presence. So, 
Work is underway on both of those, uh, focusing on creating a web, a web platform for the recently introduced safety huddle tool that we have now issued to care homes and developing uh, new capacities for virtual visits, uh, which will be of um, early assistance to residents in care homes, but again, has a longer term um, uh, functionality to it. Uh, we have also provided NHS emails to care homes so that they have a secure communication between care homes, between care homes and GP surgeries uh, and other services involved in uh, residential care. It allows um, patient identifiable information to be transferred, therefore uh, speeding up uh, access to uh, clinical care and uh, allows that um, speedy um, communication between the NHS and care homes. Uh, in terms of uh, any uh, any clinical support that a care home might need, but also in terms of the NHS in its uh, discharge procedures. So there's a, there's a lot of work un underway. There's a cross sector group which um, involves the Scottish government and COSLA and local government um, looking at an initial digital strategy by July, uh, and obviously the care home rapid action group. Uh, has an input and uh, an engagement with that, so that there is more that we can do. The other couple of it, things I would say is around, for example, the Near Me um, use of uh, digital technology to provide uh, consultations, not only from primary care, but wider now in terms of family nurse practitioners, but clearly has uh, a direct, direct relevance to uh, residential settings and is being uh, tried in those vCreate video message service and uh, other areas. Again, happy uh, convener if it's helpful to simply set all of that out for you uh, following uh, this morning's meeting. That would be very helpful. Thank you very much. And, and I call David Stewart. Thank you, uh, convener, and good morning, cabinet secretary. I could also pass on best wishes to Professor. Leach, who's becoming a well kent face on on our media, uh, and Mr. Conigan uh, as well. Um, Cabinet Secretary, the Royal College of GPs concluded in the evidence to our committee that the pandemic has, and I quote, shone a light on the persistent health inequalities that continue to exist in Scotland. All our witnesses will know this, but those who live in our most deprived areas were more than twice as likely to die with COVID-19 than those in the least deprived communities. Cabinet Secretary, I feel this is a disgrace. What action is the Scottish Government going to carry out to reverse health inequalities? Cabinet Secretary. So, so uh, Mr. Stewart is absolutely right uh, in terms of the light that has been shown on those most severely impacted uh, by COVID-19. There is also emerging uh, evidence about the longer uh, longer term impacts uh, of those who have had. Uh, the disease in terms of respiratory, um, cardiovascular and renal functions, uh, and uh, a clear indication, and I will ask Professor Leach, uh, who is much more knowledgeable about this than I, uh, a clear indication that certain underlying health conditions may make an individual uh, more susceptible to a, uh, a serious response to the infection or the infection causing uh, serious ill health in an individual than those who do not have those underlying health conditions. And some of those underlying health conditions, of course, relate back to uh, circumstances of poverty and deprivation. Uh, we are very clear. I have had conversations with the Chief Medical Officer uh, and have also tasked senior officials to look very closely, uh, not least Carol Tannehill, who uh, as I'm sure Mr. Stewart knows, uh, works in the, for the Centre for Population Health, but also uh, we benefit considerably from uh, her experience and expertise uh, to undertake a, an early piece of work looking at what more we need to do uh, to tackle population health, particularly uh, in relation to health inequalities. Um, there, there is a cleared uh, pressing demand now for us to find ways to be more effective in reducing health inequalities uh, and reaching groups of people with important but practical ways by which they can 
improve their own health that we have not so far been successful in doing in 20 years of devolution. So there is much more for us to do. We've already tasked the, the initiation of that work. And if uh, convener, if you would permit me, uh, perhaps we can uh, ask Professor Leach to add to what I've just said. Thank you very much, Jason Leach. Yeah, Mr. Stewart, you're you're absolutely correct that almost every disease imaginable has an has a gradient related to health inequality, and this disease is no different. Uh, and unfortunately, this global pandemic reveals those health inequalities in every country it touches, whether you're in South Korea, Wales, or Scotland. Uh, and it, it is a sad fact of, of life that the poor get sicker, and therefore the poor get sicker with this disease. This disease affects those with vascular diseases, such as diabetes, heart disease. It affects the obese, and it affects the elderly. Uh, and pretty much everything that you have in that list of comorbidities are higher prevalence in the poorer communities. So, therefore, your response in the medium to long term has to not be about the National Health Service. It has to include the National Health Service, but it has to include drugs and alcohol, education, housing, community, everything else that this group knows perfectly well is the way to deal with health inequalities. And COVID-19 shines a new light, I think, on those inequalities, and the cabinet secretary is absolutely right. If 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 there is nothing good about a pandemic, it, it's it's misery, misery. But if one thing can come out of it that is good, it is a renewed focus for Scotland on what those health inequalities are, and the solutions around them that this infectious disease has has brought out into the light again. Thank you very much, David Stewart. Thank you for that, these contributions. I've got a great interest in diabetes, along with some of my colleagues, chair of the cross-party group. I'm very concerned about obesity, and I realise that there is some links with COVID-19. Uh, approximately 80% of type 2 is related to obesity, as Professor Leach and the Cabinet Secretary were well aware. I do agree that we need a cross-cutting approach across Scottish Government. There is a Scottish disease um, which is really concerning me about health inequality. Would the witnesses agree on that? We need to do cross-cutting uh, policies to really tackle the appalling nature of the health inequalities we have in Scotland today. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, and, and I think we need to um, look more forensically at what cross-cutting and cross-government approach actually should be like. Um, I don't have an easy answer to this for Mr. Stewart at all, uh, but I think absolutely health uh, has a critical contribution to make to that. Uh, but as Professor Leach has said, so too does uh, our capacity to uh, to grow the economy, to uh, engage effectively with communities, uh, to look at how uh, we provide services with our partners in local government, um, but also importantly actually to listen to those communities themselves. You know, people do not willfully decide that they are going to be unhealthy, that they are willfully going to be overweight and inactive. There, there are uh, reasons that uh, we need to hear from them about what is it that uh, prevents them from living a healthier life, that, uh, and what is it about what we say that is simply not being heard. And so it is one of the key areas where our citizens' jury work, um, uh, led by our former CMO, uh, undoubtedly led by now our current CMO, our citizens' jury work, some of the other um, uh, participatory uh, engagement that we have seen across other uh, areas of uh, government uh, in the recent period. Uh, in communities and local government, but also, um, I well recall, from social security. We need to engage all of those measures to hear from people themselves about what is it they need from us uh, in order to help them uh, with their own health, their activity, and so on, uh, so that we can then use that to um, inform the kind of practical steps that we then take. And the one other area that I would mention in passing, uh, although it is important, and I don't mean 
by in passing to suggest it's not. But that is uh, an, an emerging, albeit um, at this stage, uh, very much emerging understanding about the um, vulnerability of the BAME community to this particular virus. Um, emerging uh, data and research and understanding, uh, which um, is informing some immediate steps. So we have interim guidance to our health boards about particular risk assessment approach uh, with staff who uh, are from the BAME community. Uh, but there is more to do there, which will undoubtedly inform, in a wider sense, uh, understanding of uh, the impact of viruses and infectious diseases on different cohorts of our population. David Stewart. Uh, finally, uh, convener, they may well be future pandemics or, of course, regional health emergencies such as the Putin mouth crisis in 2001. But we can read the crystal ball, um, Cabinet Secretary, that the poor will get a raw deal in these. How can we turn health inequalities on its head and place the disadvantaged at the top of the list? Cabinet Secretary. I think this is, this is a, a very important question, and actually um, I'm much taken by the way Mr. Stewart has put it. I think it is entirely fair to demand of uh, government, this government or any government, that as you plan for your response to any uh, health emergency, that your your early thoughts go straight to those who are the most disadvantaged in your society, and you work out how will this, uh, whatever it is, infectious disease, virus, whatever it might be, how is it most likely to impact on that group of people, and therefore what are the protective and mitigating steps we should take um, for that group, and that may be more than one group, um, depends on what the science and the understanding of the virus or the infection tells us. Uh, so, as we have done, for example, with those who are assessed at the highest uh, clinical risk of seriousness and death from this virus, those in our shielding category, where we have identified who uh, that group of people are the, all the clinical conditions uh, that are uh, that apply there, and the steps that we require, we advise and require them to take, but also the additional support that we put in place to support them in doing that. Then there is an argument that that way of thinking uh, should be factored into one of the strongest lessons that we learn from this experience about our future planning. Thank you very much. I now call Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I've been following the evidence session with interest this morning and looking over some of the evidence the committee has received. Um, there's been a concern that uh, the media focus around the response to the pandemic focuses understandably on planning and resilience around traditional health and social care settings so in hospitals and in in care homes, where would some stakeholders, such as Community Pharmacy Scotland, suggest perhaps at the earliest uh, start of the, the pandemic response, perhaps they could have involved a little bit more around some messaging around, for example, not, not having panic around repeat prescriptions, making sure that it's clear that there were uh, key workers in, in the response to the pandemic, and about consistency about how health boards were dealing with uh, additional demands in the community and, and, and redeploying staff there. So I just want to put that on the record from the community pharma Scotland for the outset of the pandemic. And we also got evidence from the Royal College of Pathologists that perhaps they could be a bit more involved in working out and establishing the best use of the laboratory space and capacity as we're responding to the pandemic. And I should note that they still have a degree of concern in relation to uh, how the diagnostic backlog of cases will be will be attended to moving forward, and I get and understand the pressures in relation to that. I suppose the reason I'm mentioning that, Cabinet Secretary, is to a greater or lesser extent, some witnesses uh, are keen to make sure that they are part of the discussions with government uh, and the health service uh, in relation to future planning for uh, resilience in response to the pandemic. So. What reassurances can you give that not just the organisations that I've mentioned, but a more holistic approach to taking forward planning 
as we hopefully see out as soon as possible the issues around this pandemic, but prepare, unfortunately, for the inevitable pandemic that may arise at some point in the future. So, uh, there are a number of points there, and I will do my best to be as quick as I can, but I would like to, if I may, convener, bring in uh, John Conaghan as our uh, Chief Exec of the NHS in terms of the point about the diagnostic backlog, because I think that is a really important point uh, to have a response to that on the record. Um, okay. Community Pharmacy uh, were actually one of the very first groups that I met to talk about um, their role and in the response in terms of primary care. Uh, and as you know, uh, uh, whilst we paused the introduction of Pharmacy First, which will come very shortly, uh, we did significantly increase the role that they had in uh, minor ailments and in uh, uh, the provision of um, a level of primary care service that uh, they had not they'd always always been the right place to have that role but we extended that and allowed and also removed um some technical uh, issues that were uh, preventing them for example uh, in the prescription field from doing as much as they can do um so uh, they and and the college of pathology and others i'm sure uh, will have an important input in how we learn the lessons from this pandemic and uh, build that into future planning. The, the resilience planning um, does sit within a very clear legal framework, uh, and that sets out the level one and the level two responders. That does not preclude um, hearing from others, though, uh, and I'm quite happy to make sure that as we take this forward, we we make. Uh, we make the effort to ensure that we widen the net so that we can hear from uh, all the Royal Colleges. We are very actively engaged with a number of the Royal Colleges now and in our future uh, planning for the NHS. I have been over the pandemic and in the remobilisation work, uh, but I am very happy to give that insurance, assurance, notwithstanding the fact that the resilience planning uh, framework itself is set within that very clear legal framework. Now, uh, convener, if I may, perhaps Mr. Conaghan could just briefly update the committee on the approach we're taking to deal with what what we are very well aware of is a diagnostic backlog. Bearing in mind that the nature of remobilising the NHS, whilst we are still as we are in a pandemic, uh, will mean that it is not only safely done. But it, but it will be more slowly done than we would otherwise want. Thank you very much, John Conaghan. Okay, thank you, um, Cabinet Secretary, and thank you, uh, Convener. Um, I should maybe start by saying that um, part of our response in this emergency phase of the pandemic is to keep a very close look on a daily and weekly basis uh, in terms of the use of the capacity of the NHS. Now, we're doing that primarily to ensure that we have got um, uh, enough free capacity for COVID, but it also tells us what is gradually building up as a routine backlog of diagnostic inpatient and outpatient um, services. Um, in our first phase of response to this, um, in terms of um, um, standing up services again, uh, which is covered and, and governed by the um, framework for NHS Scotland that is uh, remobilised, recovered and, design, and redesigned. We have asked boards to respond on the basis of re-establishing urgent services, and that includes diagnostics, to the end of July as a first phase of uh, re-establishing those services for uh, the NHS in Scotland. Uh, our next phase, which will be from the end of July right through to the end of the financial year in March 21, is really much more important now in terms of tackling what backlog is there. Um, uh, that needs to um, not only cover um, uh, health board planning, but it also needs to cover what, uh, cover what we can do in addition. And um, one of the considerations that we currently have underway is whether or not we can source and then deploy very quickly some mobile units across Scotland to bring the service to the people um, uh, and patients. And that would cover things like um, CT scanning, um, MRI scanning. So that's currently actively under consideration 
I mean, we will step, start that in the latter half of the first phase, which is between now and the end of July. Um, looking ahead, um, Scotland is relatively fortunate in the sense that it embarked a few years ago on a strategy to build and create additional elective units, and all of these have diagnostic capacity. The plan was that these would gradually be brought on stream out to 2035, um, uh, and I think we probably need to re-examine how fast we scale these up and how fast we now deploy them. So, we, we uh, like to put in your mind, um, a convener, that there are two responses: a short-term one um, uh, and a, a longer-term and more strategically driven one to this issue. Thank you very much, uh, Bob Dawes. Um, thank you, Mr. Conan, for for that answer to the cabinet secretary for some reassurances around a uh, community farms in Scotland. To, to be fair to them, they were talking at the very early stages of the pandemic response, but it's good that you put that on the record, cabinet secretary. Uh, I know. Time is uh, against us this morning, so I will just ask one final question. There was quite a positive suggestion made by the Royal College of Physicians in their, their, their evidence to, to the committee that I would quite like to put on, on the record and get the Cabinet Secretary's response to. Some of this may already be happening. They suggested, in terms of planning and resilience uh, going forward, there could be sleeping contracts put in place for items which would be required to respond to the pandemic, including PPE, pharmaceuticals. And resources such as laboratory space and staff. So, a proactive approach to should this terrible pandemic happen again, the the, the level of preparedness is 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 is, is, is far advanced than where it was this time. And the idea of sleeping contracts could be a very helpful thing to take forward. So, some response from the cabinet secretary in relation to that is my my final question. You know, cabinet secretary. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Doris. Uh, I'm certainly happy that we consider that. Uh, as we look at um, what uh, more we need to do in terms of future pandemic planning. Uh, of, of course, one of the, the additional points I should make is that, as you will know, uh, with thanks to my colleague Mr McKee uh, as our Minister for Trade, we have now successfully established a domestic um, production and supply chain for uh, elements of PPE. Uh, important elements of PPE, masks and, uh, uh, and aprons, uh, and I believe gowns are coming on stream too. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that that will increase uh, in terms of the volume of supply that that can give us in, in normal course, uh, but it will be an important future mitigation uh, if we have another global pandemic, because it means that we are uh, less reliant on that global marketplace with all the pressures uh, that it has been put under and will continue to be put under uh, in these circumstances. And, and that is, uh, I know, an area that uh, he is now turning his attention to in terms of other areas of supply. So I am happy to give the assurance that we will consider uh, that proposition, uh, as well as all the other uh, areas that we need to um, learn from uh, as we look at our future planning. Thank you very much. I now call Miles Briggs. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the Cabinet Secretary and the panel. Um, I wanted to ask some questions following on from Bob Doris uh, with regards to the returning of NHS services. Um, we know that last year almost 83,000 of our fellow Scots did not receive treatment uh, within the treatment time guarantee. So I wondered, in terms of the, the response to COVID, what commitment can patients expect from ministers? Um, given the pressures we have seen on the NHS over the last four months? Cabinet Secretary. So, I am sure, I'm sure Mr Briggs has um, read carefully what the framework says, and that there is a recovery group, which I will chair with all those key stakeholders. I, I will be writing to you, convener, with more details on that, and it will meet uh, before the end of this month. Uh, what the framework document, I think, is clear about is that um, we, we cannot flick a switch and turn the NHS back on, uh, as it was, uh, for example, at November or December last year. That is simply not possible for a number of reasons. First of all, we are still in the middle of a pandemic. We still have COVID cases. We still have a virus to suppress and control. And we need to retain capacity to ensure that we could cope with a second wave if one comes. 
Uh, all of that is vitally important. We also have a health service where a significant proportion of its workforce are both physically and emotionally exhausted from the efforts that they have uh, put in in order to address the immediate pandemic response that has gone on for uh, very many weeks. Uh, RCN have made that point, BMA, Unison, uh, many others. And so we need to um, create the space for that group of staff themselves to recover, which will, for example, mean that that group of returners that we secured uh, in order to respond to the pandemic may well be a group of people we hold on to for longer in order to allow, if you like, that recovery time. Uh, all of that, uh, along with the planning that Mr Conaghan uh, has described initially to the end of July, uh, but, but more strategically and importantly, through from then to the end of this parliamentary term, in effect, uh, all of that will, will factor into it what exactly we can realistically and uh, with uh, best attention to clinical priorities say to patients in an open way about what they can expect for the treatment and the time before they are treated for any of their particular conditions, also making care that we retain some of the innovative and uh, safe and clinically productive ways of delivering healthcare that we have seen in the NHS's response to the pandemic so far. Miles Briggs. Um, thank you uh, for that answer. Yesterday, we heard concerns expressed by orthopaedic specialists uh, with regards to the significant increase in capacity. If that is not put in place, then severe increases in waiting times. For example, it was pointed out by orthopaedic specialist John Deering, he was worried uh, waiting times could increase from almost a year to three years. I wondered what the Cabinet Secretary's response to that was and how capacity will really be put in place um, <laughs> to actually make sure that people are not facing that sort of waiting time. Cabinet Secretary. So, so I, I want to say two things, and then I do want to bring Mr. Conaghan in. Um, two things I think it's really important to say is, first of all, uh, and I make no apology for repeating myself, we are still in the middle of a pandemic. It hasn't gone away, it's still there. So our NHS is still responding to that pandemic, as am I, as are all my senior officials, not least the chief executive of our NHS and our clinicians. Secondly, alongside that, we are making every effort we can in a way that is clinically safe and allowing the health service to retain capacity to respond to the pandemic to work through the best ways by which we can restart the NHS across primary, secondary and acute, so across all of those services, retaining the important innovative but effective uh, steps in delivery of health care that have appeared or been uh, upscaled in response to the pandemic. So the specific answers to the specific questions from Mr Briggs, it would be irresponsible of me at this point to preempt that work by our boards, by Mr Conaghan and by due consideration. That is the point of planning initially to the end of July, but more importantly, planning from July through to March. As soon as we are able to respond directly to those legitimate concerns and questions from patients as well as from senior uh, clinicians and others, then we will absolutely do that. But we need to work through the process at the same time as we respond to the pandemic. Now, Mr Conaghan has given a great deal of thought to this. He is leading this work. Uh, with considerable experience and expertise over many years, and he may now, at this point, want to add a few points to what I've just said. Thank you very much, John Conaghan. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll make I make this relatively short, um, given given the time, um, uh, Mr. Briggs. It might be useful if um, I send you a copy of the of the notes that I issued to uh, chief execs, chief officers. Um, and uh, chief executives of local authorities, including COSLA, um, uh, which was about the next phase of the NHS response in terms of mobilisation. And that lays out in a six-page note the detail 
um, that we expect to be taken forward in terms of re-establishing services, which of the peaks, but obviously many other services between now and the end of the end of July, and, and that might give you some answers to um, uh, some of the questions. Um, a couple of other things, just um, in terms of what patients should expect. Um, patients, as we go forward, should expect a slightly different engagement with the uh, with the NHS um, in, in future uh, around things like near me. Um, uh, and this is where we replace face to face consultations with digital consultations. And we're finding that patients are readily engaging with that. So are clinicians. Uh, and it's not just in the secondary care sector, but it's also primary care. And some tens of thousands of patients have already been seen in, in a safer and indeed in a faster way in terms of initial assessment, and that obviously includes orthopaedics. Um, the other thing that we should expect, um, Mr. Briggs, in the in, in, in the very near future, and for the next phase of our rollout of um, NHS services being re-established. Is the creation of some additional capacity where we can. So, if I take, for example, Golden Jubilee, um, it is already laying plans to expand its capacity quite significantly in the next phase, um, and we expect to see that in, in a lot more detail um, when they respond on the on the, on, on the period out to um, at the end of 2021. And the last thing I would say is that, uh, and this perhaps goes back into the territory of assessing risk. Um, we don't ju just do this in isolation. We need to consider the balance of risks um, over the next six to nine months in terms of maintaining a COVID-19 response in the system, um, uh, and dealing with the backlog, but also considering, as the Cabinet Secretary said, the workforce, and more importantly, also um, uh, the impact of the winter that's coming in, in 2021. I, um, I hope we all we all hope for a mild winter, but the balance of all those risks. Which is exceptionally complex in terms of planning needs to be in our in our in our plans uh, for the next six to nine months as well. Thank you very much. We look forward to receiving those notes, Mr. Conaghan. That's very helpful. And a brief final question from Miles Briggs. Miles Briggs. Thank, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, that's very helpful. Thank you, uh, Mr. Conaghan. What my final question was with regards to old cancer screening services we've seen. I wanted to know in terms of. <laughs> Scale when we're likely to see those uh, start again, especially bowel cancer screening, and and what actual lab capacity for the screening programs haven't been utilised during this process? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Briggs can expect to see the screening programs starting up very soon. Uh, some of that will be covered in uh, what the First Minister says uh, tomorrow at the, the normal review period. Uh, but we are very conscious, and I think I have said in the chamber that, uh, as I think the First Minister has also uh, made this point, that uh, the cancer screening services are a really important and priority area for us to uh, recommence. Uh, we need to be able to do that, as of course, in a way that is safe. Uh, the, the main uh, challenge there is around breast screening, uh, but colleagues are working on how that uh, can be safely done in a way that um, also uh, ensures that those individuals you recall we paused the programme uh, so that we didn't lose people. Uh, and so part of the work that is underway is looking at how we can uh, both uh, screen those individuals who should have been screened uh, during uh, the most recent period uh, at the same time as not putting uh, delay into those who would be coming up now for screening. So you, you have to run a bit of a parallel process as best you can. Uh, on the, your, your point about uh, lab capacity, I do not have that information in front of me, but I am very happy um, to uh, look that out and send it on to, uh, on to you, um, Mr Briggs, but also, of course, to the convener. Thank you very much, Captain Secretary. And our final questions are from George Adams. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, you said earlier on that uh, we're looking at ways that what helps people live healthier lifestyles, and I was wanting to ask questions about healthy lifestyles and behaviours and balancing uh, of uh, lifestyles. Now, there's been reports in the press and various other ways of people are drinking more alcohol, eating more. Uh, during lockdown, mainly because 
eating probably three meals a day actually break the day for them when they're uh, living there as is. So uh, also, when there's other stories of people using this opportunity to go out and get fit, born again cyclists, men of various ages going about Paisley and uh, Lycra. Uh, you know, really, uh, do you? Is it possible for you to actually get this data to see what is true and what is actually happening? And if you can, and if you get that data, then is there a way that you can either change behaviour when we come out, and we move forward? or find a way for us to be able to uh, encourage these people who have maybe changed their lifestyle for the positive to continue doing that? Uh, th thanks very much, uh, Mr Adam, for the question. Um, th there are, as I think you have probably seen, uh, some steps that local authorities have taken uh, in order to uh, encourage people, for example, uh, to keep uh, cycling uh, and walking. Uh, and it is part of uh, our guidance to uh, folks in terms of uh, where they have to uh, travel to work um, to uh, cycle and walk as much as uh, they possibly can uh, in the current period. But we're also working with Public Health Scotland and others, uh, including the Mental Health Advisory Group, the Drugs Death Task Force, and uh, the Physical Activity Development Group, to see if we can capture the impact of COVID-19 uh, and the response of the population on a range of health outcomes, including mental health, uh, physical activity, diet, alcohol intake, drugs, tobacco, and weight, uh, to see if we can capture what what has happened and what has been the impact. Um, PA, public Health Scotland uh, have developed a public health uh, surveillance system for problem drug use. Uh, in light of the pandemic, uh, and uh, there is other work underway. We commission, as a government, uh, weekly service, uh, surveys, uh, which provide some limited evidence on health behaviours and outcomes. Uh, and uh, we've recently commissioned Ipsos Mori uh, for a survey on health and well-being during lockdown to see if we can uh, understand from those survey responses where there have been positive changes and what we might do to encourage people to hold on to those, where there have been negative uh, changes in behaviour in terms of people's health or mental well-being, uh, what we might do in response to that. And there is a mental health tracker study of 2,500 adults in Scotland, again, that we commissioned. Uh, it was launched uh, on the 28th of May, and it will track the impact of COVID-19 on various aspects of mental health uh, in the participants for a year. Um, so the baseline survey is uh, currently in the field. The results are expected in July, and then we will carry that forward uh, over the coming year. In addition, the Chief Scientist's Office uh, has uh, funded about 55 uh, projects uh, related uh, to COVID, and several of those are about understanding the longer-term health impacts of, uh, for example, social distancing and other behavioural interventions that we have asked the population to undertake to prevent the spread of the population. So all of all of that work is underway, uh, and some of it will have immediate and direct relevance to how we, as a government, respond in the months ahead. Georgia, thank you. My final question would be, I'm glad you brought up mental health in particular, because uh, the first question was talking about the physical health. Obviously, we know there's, in my constituency, along with others, there's many people who had mental health uh, issues before lockdown. Some have had to shield as well during that period. I've got one constituent in particular I can think of with regards to that. And uh, also, there'll be mental health issues with people who during the lockdown have maybe had some challenges themselves as well. Uh, I know you mentioned, because you maybe give me some more detail on the fact that what are we looking at doing when we come out of those uh, lockdown for those that are possibly have been shielding and had mental health issues beforehand, and also those that have maybe developed uh, some, some mental health issues over the period of lockdown? Captain Secretary. So there have been a, a number of additional mental health supports introduced uh, during the pandemic. Um, 
uh, one of those, the Clear Your Head campaign, will continue um, for some time, helping uh, all of us look after our own mental health and well-being. Uh, there has been support services introduced, delivered in a different way. So the NHS 24 Mental Health Hub, Breathing Space and Distress Brief Intervention Programme all have remained available throughout the pandemic. And our uh, NHS Mental Health Services uh, have uh, remained open uh, and, in, and delivered, for, uh, in many instances, in a different way, but in a way that, uh, from information so far received, uh, patients uh, and those using them have responded to very well. Uh, I think you'll know this afternoon my colleague Ms Hockey is making a statement to Parliament where she will uh, touch on uh, uh, what has been done so far uh, and where she wants to uh, then lead that work in, uh, in the months ahead. The other side of that that I would want to mention um, is uh, the mental health and well-being of our staff. Uh, again, uh, a lot of uh, supports introduced from very practical um, uh, steps uh, in terms of just space to get a breather and to sit and have a quiet five or ten minutes uh, in the middle of your shift and make a cup of tea, uh, through to uh, counselling uh, and coaching services for uh, health and social care staff uh, provided by Promise, based on trauma counselling uh, for individuals who have been uh, probably in some of the most traumatic of situations as they deliver health and social care. Uh, all of that we intend to continue, and indeed uh, the ministerial group looking at well-being and culture in our NHS uh, is meeting this week, uh, and part of what we will be looking at is what we retain uh, and the importance of retaining all of that as we come through the pandemic. And the final point. I would make is that the uh, mental uh, health needs of those who have been hospitalised as a consequence of uh, COVID, uh, including those who um, have been in intensive care on ventilation uh, and have now uh, been discharged. It is a long rehabilitation process, and a significant part of that will be mental health, where we will be learning from our trauma network, which is, you will know, has built in very importantly the this, this psychological support needed for those who have experienced uh, physical trauma in a major accident. So it's not just the physical healing that is needed, but also the psychological support that is needed. And that will be very helpful to us as we look to see what more we can do in the rehabilitation and support of those who are um, who have suffered from uh, COVID-19 and in a serious way requiring hospitalisation and uh, ICU intervention. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes our questions and concludes this evidence session. Can I thank yourself and your officials for taking part in this meeting? We look forward to hearing from you and from your colleagues uh, with the documents that you mentioned and in the course of your evidence. Thank you very much. We now move on to the second item on our agenda, which is consideration of one negative instrument the Food Information and Addition of Vitamins, Minerals and Other Substances Scotland Amendment Regulations 2020. Can I ask if any colleagues have any comments on this uh, instrument? If there are no comments, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? That is agreed. Thank you very much. That concludes the public part of this morning's meeting. Uh, the next meeting of the committee will be at 9 o'clock on Tuesday, and the agenda will be provided in the business bulletin and via the committee's social media. Uh, we will now suspend briefly and resume uh, at 10.55 uh, on another platform. Uh, thank you very much. I now suspend this meeting.